Hello, Hopkinton viewers. Welcome to another segment of Veterans Remember, produced by HCAM Studios on Main Street. You're very fortunate to be able to see and hear history unfold right before you. One-on-one -on -one conversations with veterans represent the hundreds of men and women from town who have and continue to serve in the military in a variety of ways and in a variety of places. Uh, I'm Hank Alessio, uh, pinch hitting for Dick Gooding, who's the assigned facilitator, but with a scheduling difficulty. Uh, I'm on TDY, temporary duty tonight. Uh, my service, uh, two years of active duty, started February of 62 in the Army Signal Corps. Sharing the lens with me for this segment of Veterans Remember is Francis X. Bowker, and for you, Jerry Bowker. Uh, he's a very popular Hopkintonian and very generous with his sharing of his military experiences. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you Thank for you. coming. Enjoy being with you every time. Uh, during the onset of the Second World War, uh, Hopkinton was much smaller than it is today. Very much smaller. And I'm wondering, is the small town nature of 1942, 1943, something that affected your joining the service and others and your friends joining the service? No. I come from a staunch military family, and quite frankly, I couldn't wait to get into the service. <laughs> My brothers, the world and I am, all went before me and uh, did well. So my turn came and I went, and then I had three younger brothers that all went in. So there were six of us in all together. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine with uh, the, the small town nature and everyone knowing everyone else, and uh, as someone said before, no secrets in town, uh, the, hop, uh, the um, Bowker household must have had some interesting points of view with so many able-bodied young men ready to go in the service and this big war on. Well, we all went in in a short period of time, believe it or not. Mm. As soon as you got old enough, you went in. Yeah. For example, my younger brother that died in the service, uh, he went in the day he turned 17. And I, they wouldn't believe him at Fort Devens, and I got a telephone call from him to bring up his birth certificate. So I drove up to Fort Devens and went in, inside the camp I knew his address, so they directed me, the military police direct, brought me right to that address. I went in, and there was my brother and two officers. And one of the officers believed his age, but the other one wouldn't. So I had to go up there with a birth certificate, and I handed it to him, and he looked at him, and he says, all set then. He says, you may go now. So I went out and I got in my car and I turned around and I got out to the main gate and they wouldn't let me out. And uh, because they didn't believe the story I told them. So I had to go back in and find one of those officers, at least one of them, to ride out with me so I could get out. And that's how I get out. And I got home at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Usually so, you're fighting to get in, and you were fighting to get yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Uh, and uh, in your high school class here in Hopkinton, roughly what percent of the uh, fellows ended up serving? Oh, there was a very high percentage. I lost a lot of my classmates mm -hmm. in the service. I lost, I think it was. Six or seven altogether. Oh, wow. That sounds like a high percentage out of a small school. My very best friend who lived right next door to me, George Lowell, was killed over in Fretton Road of Germany. And uh, Merton Chenard and Peter Cole and, and uh, Alden Sables. Uh, oh, I didn't know. I did have a list of all of them in my mind, but mm -hmm. all good friends of mine got killed. 
Billy Whalen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all went. Mm -hmm. well, when, when I th think of you, uh, Jerry, I, I think of my short time in the service. And uh, I would have picked up a number of gigs or maybe even an Article 13 for not wearing my uniform. Mm -hmm. But you're the one guy I know that made a career of not wearing a uniform. That's right. Tell me about that, or tell us about that. Well, uh, when I was in high school up here, I took French the first year, and I liked it so well, I took it for, took it for two more years. <laughs> and uh, I had it down pretty much to a T. And uh, upon filling out my military application, I they wanted to know if you spoke any foreign languages. So I said, yes, three years of French. And it made a big difference in my career in the service because I took an exam and basic training and passed it with flying colors. And, and I was immediately put into uh, military intelligence as a French interpreter. It helped in one sense, but not the other, because the next thing I knew, I was being loaded onto the QE2 in New York, and I was on my way over to Europe. And uh, there were 28 of us went, and uh, none of us knew where we were going or what we were going to be doing or anything else. We didn't discuss any of our uh, ability to speak a foreign language. But uh, I befriended a couple of the fellows, and we were trying to figure out what are we going to be doing over there. But we couldn't figure it out. But one of the fellows we had, his name was Hanson. He was formerly in, he had three brothers that went to West Point, and he was the fourth one that went. But he was a lover type, and he found too many girlfriends on the other side of the fence. So he, they got rid of him. And he was in our group. And uh, we were on the QE2 going over, and I was up on the upper deck with him. And the next thing I know, he off he takes his life jacket and he threw it at a sailor. <laughs> and who was the sailor but his younger brother? And uh, that introduced us more or less to the kitchen facilities of the QE2. We got a hot loaf of bread every day. That's all we ate. We couldn't stand that, uh, those stews that they made on uh, mutton. They were just a little too greasy. <laughs> so we just ate bread, and I bought a box of Zagnut candy bars, and I'd break one in half and give him a half, and I'd eat a half. And that's what we thrived on going over. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, on the way over, they dropped 17, 17 depth charges and sunk a couple of German submarines. And the next day on the PA system on the boat, it came over that the Germans had sunk the QE2 that was loaded with troops heading for Europe. And of course, there was no, there was sure. no truth to it at yeah. all. We succeeded, and the two subs went down. Mm. But uh, we had a lot to discuss about that. Mm. and the food on the ship and so forth. But so, so as you're steaming to Europe, you still uh, never heard of the word Alsace. You know, you no, don't no, know. never heard of it. No, 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 none of us could figure out what we were doing on yeah. that ship, 28 of us. Yeah, when, when did that, well, no, let me, before we go to there, with your language proficiency, what kind of training did you go through in the States? Did you not go through the normal basic training? Yes, I went through the basic training mm -hmm. in the States, yeah. And uh, I was known as the grenade thrower <laughs> in basic training. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was is because they drew a big circle, out of, made a circle out of lime. And there was a second lieutenant standing on the outside of the circle on the back part of it. And they handed me a grenade, a dead, a dead grenade. And I threw it, threw it and it bounced off his chest. <laughs> And, and he yelled out, who threw that grenade? And I says, I did, sir. 
And he says, was that intentional? And I says, of course not. And I says, I was trying to get it in the circle, but it just went further, that's all. No, we, we've got to be nicer to second lieutenants, Jerry. Well, anyway, I, <laughs> I fit it in, and we became very good friends. Mm. So then he made me an assistant grenade thrower to the classes that were coming up. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing to it. You just put, your, put it in your hand, center of your hand, and just let it go, that's all. Mm -hmm. So I got the reputation on the Alsace mission that I was later assigned to as being the grenadier. Mm -hmm. And I did. I got rid of a lot of grenades during mm -hmm. the war. When you got to Europe, did you have to go through some other orientation to uh, oh, yes. prepare uh, for Alsace? Yes, we uh, landed in Greenock, Scotland, and there was, I say, 28 of us, and there was a little Scotchman that brought the raft out to the side of the QE2. We were the first ones off, and it was raining cats and dogs, and we headed for shore. And that little guy didn't let up on the accelerator one bit of that little one horse engine in the middle of it. We hit the shore with such force that several of the fellows lost their luggage off the sides. And uh, in the pelting rain, I looked up and I saw a man in a black cape and a tall black hat on with an um and he had a black umbrella. And he came running down through the field towards the raft and he yelled out my name. And I said to myself, how in the heck does he know my name? So I stepped up to him and he says, uh, you're Mr. Bowker? And I said, yes. He says, uh, okay, you are the French interpreter of this group. And you're going to be going into France very shortly. So I don't, wanna, I don't want you to get out of my sight. So he says, turn around. We'll, we're going to take half the men and bring them up and put them on one train. And we're going to have the other half follow us in case of a bombing. So we get into uh, a little area of England, what they call, the, the code name was Feezy Farms. And uh, we, the second day we were there, we were given the privilege of going up into the park and doing what we wanted. Well, we went up to the park and we started playing ball. And the V-2 rockets were flying coming in in all directions over our heads and damaging buildings and destroying property and so forth. And, and we got to the point that, what the heck, if our time comes, it's here and mm -hmm. not going to be in Germany. So anyway, things kind of calmed down enough that we took cover and were saved and not, nobody got hurt or anything. So uh, we then continued on our mission and and uh, got gathered up around six o'clock that night and brought in for chow and and uh, everything was very informal with us. I don't know why, but we just treated funny. And uh, they sat us down to a big mutton stew, which nobody, I don't think nobody took a bite out of it. A <laughs> bite of the stew it was so terrible. So. On the way over on the ship, I had bought a bag of Zagnut candy bars and a box of little cookies, like Oreo cookies only. They were just some other brand. And I paid uh, $10 for the candy bars and $2 for the package of cookies. Well, I had the guys huddling around me like you wouldn't believe, but I just made up my mind, I'm going to eat something other than mutton stew on the way over. Yeah. Judy has some recipes for you. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, enjoyed my food, and I dished some of it out to some of the other fellows, and uh, they were good friends of mine. And uh, the next thing, when we get on the boat, we were over there before I realized it. It only took us a few days, uh, three or four days, to get over there. Mm -hmm. And we zigzagged all the way across to avoid any mine sweep, mine, mining work. Mm. And uh, it, we, uh, as I say, we get on that raft, and I didn't think, 
I feared that raft more than I did going over into a war zone, to tell you the truth. One of the things that I've always wondered about your service, uh, dealing without a uniform and dealing behind the lines often, uh, is there anything that's relevant uh, for the viewers regarding how you were trained if you were captured? Oh, yes. Yeah, if we were captured by the German army, uh, uh, we were not to say a word, just to read our serial number, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a couple of guys that got captured right away, and that's all they did, and we never expected to see them again. But about a week later, they came ambling in to headquarters, and then they were put back into service, mm -hmm. into the lines again. But... Uh, he said they weren't mistreated. The food was better than it was on board ship. And uh, therefore, they went back to their job again and were assigned to another group, of course. Mm -hmm. Because in our organization, uh, I was the leader of one group, and they, uh, each group had three, uh, three men in it, the leader and two other, uh, two other men. And uh, we didn't have to wear uniforms if we didn't want to. And we didn't have to wear the, we couldn't wear the U.S. buttons on our uniforms if we wore them. And uh, we weren't allowed to carry any machine guns or any such weapon as that. We only were allowed to carry a carbine and a pistol. Mm -hmm. And your bayonet, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, we're assigned in groups of three. And as I say, I was appointed as a group leader, and our job was to go behind the German lines and capture scientists and technicians who were working on the A-bomb. We didn't know what the A-bomb was when we were told it, about it, but it didn't take us long afterwards to find out. And we would get behind the German lines. We were given rations for three days. And we'd stay behind the German lines and hide. And if you ran out of food, I was known as the goose eggs thief. I would go to the, chicken, the, the goose houses and steal half a dozen or a dozen goose eggs and boil them in my helmet. And that's what we ate for food. No bread, no nothing else with it, just a plain Better, better than the mutton, huh? Better than mutton it was, <laughs> anyway. Well, it got to the point one time that we get behind the German lines and we were there for seven days and we had run out of food after the third day. So we got pretty hungry. And I entered a old farmer's barn and I heard the bleeding of a newborn calf. So I ended up walking out of the barn with a calf over my shoulders and brought him up into the woods and slaughtered him, scun him, and I never did this in my life. And I cleaned them all out and we ate veal. We lit a fire, we cooked them over the veal fire, and we had pretty good veal. I, didn't, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> it was better than nothing. Hunger makes a good cook. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the type of life we led. We had to fend for ourselves an awful lot. And we didn't use vehicles. We were just dropped off at certain points by a vehicle and said, okay, you're right at the edge of the, your town now and we want you to get in and see what you can find out. So we'd get in. The first person we'd go after would be the Bürgermeister, who was the, like the mayor of the town or city. And uh, we'd try to capture him without hurting him. And uh, we'd load him up with cigarettes. I didn't smoke, so I had always a carton of cigarettes in my pouch and chewing gum and maybe a couple of candy bars or something like that. But I'd bribe him along with food and smokes. And the next thing you know, he'd be on our side of the fence and telling us everything we wanted to know. Mm. And given us names of people that he thought were working in these secret laboratories that they had. 
Mm. Which you, were very, he was very, they were very helpful to us. G given that you were after scientists and technicians, were there any of them that you apprehended that were of note? I mean, were there any Werner von Braun's or Goddard's or people well, like that? Well, I was in on the capture of General von Rundstadt. Uh, I, can, I can remember that morning very clear. And uh, he was removed from a Volkswagen, German Volkswagen, and he was put, I helped him over to the uh, command car, and he got in the back seat of the command car and was very happy that he was captured, believe it or not. You know, I thought he, that we were gonna run into a little trouble, but he, he didn't, he was very cooperative, and got in the back seat there, as if he owned the car, and off they took him to some area for interrogation work. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, in the interest of time, uh, let's go to your uh, your cache of show and tell. Okay. And uh, we can uh, wrap the, if you feel this is a that's, significant that's okay. one to start with. Yeah, that that woman was in the uh, Coast Guard, and she was connected to uh, the Alsace mission, and uh, she smuggled the constituents for the A-bomb in her underwear and brought it over to the United States and turned it, and she was met by a group of men over here and turned all her belongings that she had that pertained to the A-bomb to them. And then that, a that was transported immediately to the area where they were manufacturing the A-bomb. And that's how the uh, recipe of the A-bomb got into the United States. Mm -hmm. And I knew her when she was this uh, age down here, when she first was, was a young girl. And I worked with her father down at the Angel Corporation down in Framingham. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a very nice old man. Yeah, by the way, uh, for those who are uh, historians or researchers, uh, Alsos, you can Google the, the bajikers out of it, is A-L-S-O-S. -S. That's a postcard there. I think that's Goering in the middle. And uh, I just grabbed a stack of them and threw them in my musette bag and brought them home. And I've got some other ones of theirs, some other prominent people. That's been all messed up. It's all right. Well, if there's something significant. Well, that there. was in Bad Schwabach. That was a, a rest area for the German army officers. And uh, after the, when the war was dwindling down, we were allowed to get into there. And uh, they posted a notice on the bulletin board that there'd be a truck going to the movies on this particular night, and you had to sign up to go to the movies. So there were 12 men signed up for the trip to the movies, and the truck never returned. They found the empty truck with 12 decapitated men in it. Oh, boy. Yeah, that was, that's my, that's the, that's the military French book they give you when you're going to, Intelligence, and it's very, it's very juvenile in my opinion, compared to any French books I ever had. But that's the Arc de Triomphe on the back page. Okay. And that is a German Luger that uh, I captured from a German uh, uh, mountain officer. And it's a very valuable weapon. I've refused $375 for it, which I don't know what I'm ever gonna do with it. I, I have three daughters and I know they don't want it. But uh, I took that weapon from him. It's a 1913 model. It's the first model of a German Luger that was ever made. And that's what the value is so high for. 
And that was the medal offered that officer that owned that gun, that one of our men went over and ripped all his decora decorations and medals off of his uniform and stomped on them on the ground on the, in the snow. And uh, that's one of the medals that he ripped off. And I made the, I saw him do it, and I made him go over and pick the medals up and put them back on the officer, which he did, because I had one more stripe than he did. <laughs> and uh, he pinned all the medals back on him. So when things would calm down, the officer no took to all his medals off, and he handed them to me, and he says, here are Sergeant, he says, you may have my medals. So I took his medals and I got them home. Yeah. Those are the clips of ammunition for the carbines that we carried. Mm -hmm. And that was the only protection we had was a carbine rifle. Mm -hmm. That's part of the Germans. Mm -hmm. Let's see if something here. You got some pictures of Mussolini hanging there somewhere, don't you? Is anything? Let's see. Just well, those are just orders. Right. Let's. I don't know what you're going to find in there. That's a 50 caliber shell that was used mostly by tanks. Yeah, this newspaper looks. Oh yeah, looks interesting. Let's see if we can get off of him. Well, that's the that's my brother's. Uh, it was in the 79th Division, and that's their insignia. And any news of the 79th would be in that little newspaper. Actually, that might be a, a good way to to tidy up. There you have it, Hopkinton. Another good reason for you to be proud uh, and secure. Uh, thanks for watching.